our experience is based on 17,000 cases uh, of which 2,000 are revisions. So we're going to be talking about 2,000 revision cases. We wrote three papers. The first paper was in about 1980, and it summarized our feelings at that time. Uh, our success rate in 1980 was 50 percent. That was doing all revisions because in the beginning we revised all of the, the failures that we saw. For example, we revised a, a sensory neural loss done with a, a, a vein graft and a, and a piston. Uh, we revised uh, uh, fulminating otosclerosis foot plates that did well for a while and then the, the, uh, the disease came back. Uh, almost everything. When we looked at our results, there were about 20 percent of the patients that did not improve in any way. So we eliminated those from 1980 on. And when we looked at our results in the, in the mid-90s, uh, we had gone to a 70 percent success rate by eliminating those cases that shouldn't be done. And we'll talk more about those later on. The big next change came in 1995 when we started to use the laser. Our results then went from a 70 percent success rate to an 81 percent success rate. But then the last move came with the laser when we went back and looked at the impossible cases that we had. There were, there were several t types that were very difficult. I'm going to discuss those later too. So in the, the cases that only can be helped with a laser, there's a, we, we go from an 80 percent to a 90 percent success rate. But our laser in general took us from 70 to 80. So going all the way to the end, and having been through this experience starting in the beginning and starting without laser, I would recommend that people who do revision surgery should very definitely have the laser as part of their weapons and don't, you shouldn't be doing revision stapedectomies unless you use the laser. I don't mean that I'm a laser surgeon. I use the laser when it's important, but you've got to be able to use it in revision stapedectomies. Now before we talk about the selection of the patients in stapedectomies, let me give you a certain mindset that sometimes takes a long time to develop, and that is the first thing about selecting your patients for revision stapedectomies is to think not to do them. Because so many times we see patients who have had one two, uh, original stapedectomy, a revision, a second revision, and they're sent to us for a third revision. Now, here's an e and, and the ears are equal, or darn near equal. Now, why in the world would we do a third revision, or a second revision, or a first revision on an ear that has had a previous surgery because we know in general that on a revision we have an 80 percent chance. We know that on a primary stapedectomy we're well into the 90s. So if I had two ears that were equal and I had had a right stapedectomy on the right ear and it was equal to the left ear and I was going to have another surgery, I would have a left stapedectomy done. We did a series that showed, we looked at failures. There is no relationship between failing in one ear and failing in the other ear, none whatsoever. There is no relationship in, in, in doing an ear in, in one year and 15 years later having a sudden hearing loss and then doing the other ear and not having a good result that. There is no relationship between the results of the two ears. The history is important and I'm mainly interested in taking the patient's history on who was the previous surgeon and what is the attitude of the patient. You know, I've, in all the revisions I've done, I revised one case of John Shays, that's all. Uh, if the previous operator was a good surgeon and he didn't get a good result, you better stay away from that case. If the previous surgeon is an inexperienced surgeon, those are the cases that you're more likely to help. The other important part of the history is the attitude of the patient. If the patient is anxious to tell you how he was butchered or how he had this horrible surgery by someone, you better be very, very leery about doing that patient. If he's one of those people, you don't want him for a patient. Send him elsewhere. The operative report can be or cannot be very important. 
if the surgeon was a good surgeon, it's an important operative report, and you can read it and, and learn from it. Uh, if it wasn't a good surgeon, you can probably discard it. It's important to know about how long the surgery took. It's, it's important to know what prosthesis the surgeon used. Did he, use a, did he do a stapedectomy or a stapedotomy? It's, it's important to know how long it took him to do the operation. It's important to know when the operative note is dict was dictated. We have a rule that you cannot leave the operating room before you've dictated that case. I see many patients who had a, a, an operation in October with a dictation in December. Now, maybe the person who did uh, that operation has got, a, has got a much better memory than I do. I can't remember the next day. I can't remember the details. So look at when the operation was done and when it was dictated. If, it was dicta if there was a long interval, the operative report is absolutely of no consequence. The next thing you want to know is, you know, which are the good patients to revise? The best patient to revise is a patient where the hearing went up and then down. The patient who did not change at all is not a good patient for a revision if, a, if the patient was done by a good surgeon. The patient where the hearing went down is usually not a good patient to revise. The patient who's dizzy, we'll talk about more later, is a good patient to revise. A lot of the dizzy patients you can help. Another good case to revise is the case where the posterior cruise technique was used. They're very, very easy to revise. The, pa the cases that are important to revise is where they were done without a tissue graft, especially a wire without a tissue graft, because many of those are going to be fistulae. And sensory neural losses where there is a wire used with no graft. Those, those cases you must, must reoperate, you must do a revision. There are a few interesting patients or symptoms that we like to see. Let's take the patient with vibration. Uh, vibration in their ear when they talk loud or when someone talks loud to them. In almost all cases, these are due to a short prosthesis. They come on six weeks to two months after surgery because in the first couple of months, your graft is more swollen, and as the, gra as the the graft becomes less swollen and thinner, then the prosthesis, if it's too short, begins to cause a problem. And if you're going to revise these, don't even use a longer prosthesis. Just use a second tissue graft on top of the first. We use a vein graft from the back of the arm. And if we're going to revise it because of vibration, we will simply take out the prosthesis, put in a second graft. That's all the extra distance that you use. We discovered it first when we used to measure to decide what length of prosthesis to use. And, and a few of those we put a three and a half millimeter prosthesis. One of those came back after two months with the vibration. About the same time we operated a patient who lived a great distance away. And she called us in two months with this vibration when she spoke and when other people spoke. Uh, we were going to have her come back to see, her, to see us and she called and said, I'm pregnant and the vibration has gone away. Well, what happened was when she became pregnant, you know, the tissues became more swollen, the process was, was no longer short. I held my breath for seven months until she delivered, and after she delivered, that vibration did not come back. But these are great patients to revise. You really help them, and that's the reason for the vibration, a short prosthesis. If the prosthesis is too long, you get a couple of things. You get dizziness, and you also get in a great number of patients, uh, the patient who says to you, I'm having a problem with my concentration, with my thinking. Uh, I, I used to be able to remember every phone number. I used to remember things. I don't remember them anymore. And I will not lead this patient into this history. I will say, are you having any problems uh, with your mind? I'll give them a very vague question. And this particular answer comes back. So look for the symptom of I'm, I'm having problems with memory, with lack of concentration as a long prosthesis. Now the fistula patient is going to have dizziness, fluctuating hearing, and, and in some cases a positive fistula test where you press on the tragus and you can see the nystagmus that is produced.